Welcome to Real Chemistry. I'm Dr. Morris. What we're gonna talk about today is molecular orbital diagrams. We're not gonna practice drawing specific diagrams. That's what we'll do in a later video. I'll link to that below. What we're gonna do here is try to understand what molecular orbital diagrams are. There's a tendency in chemistry to just figure out how to do a problem, how to write down the stuff to get the points, but not ever actually really understand what's going on. And so the goal of this video is to understand molecular orbital diagrams. And they're actually really similar to something that you did in general chemistry. So you might remember what I have drawn down here, which is an atomic orbital diagram. And atomic orbital diagrams tell us how the electrons are smeared out around an atom. This says, oh, we have two electrons in the 1s orbital, two electrons in the 2s orbital, and four total electrons in p orbitals, of which there are three. And molecular orbital diagrams do very much the same thing. Instead of telling us how electrons are smeared out around an atom, they tell us how electrons are smeared out around a molecule. But of course, molecules are made up of atoms. And so molecular orbital diagrams turn out to be built up from atomic orbitals because that's the orbitals we have to work with when we're building up how we smear out electrons around a molecule. What do molecular orbital diagrams do for us? Well, they tell us where our molecular orbitals come from. Do they come from the 1s or the 2s or the 2p atomic orbitals? So we're going to build up our molecular orbitals with atomic orbitals. And the molecular orbitals will tell us where they came from. They'll also tell us what the names of the molecular orbitals are, right? So over here in our atomic orbitals, we have names like 1s, 2s, and 2p. For molecular orbitals, you have slightly different names, which we'll get to in a second. It'll also tell you, just like an atomic orbital diagram, are there electrons in this molecular orbital, or is it empty? There's a lot of the rules you'll find that are the same. For example, we'll fill orbitals up from the lowest energy to the highest. We'll put in unpaired electrons before we put paired electrons. No more than two electrons can go in an orbital. All of these rules you know, and now we're going to apply them to molecules. But before you can do that, you have to understand something about atomic orbitals that's lots of times glossed over in general chemistry. And that is that atomic orbitals have phases. That is, they can be positive or negative, much like the sine function has portions below the x-axis and portions above the y-axis, your atomic orbitals have phases. It's a little hard to express because it's also three-dimensional. But here is one way we can express the phases. This is a p orbital, right? And the top portion here has a positive phase and the bottom portion has a negative phase. These guys are two different s orbitals. One has a negative phase throughout and one has a positive phase throughout. And so when I combine those, those can constructively or destructively interfere, much like waves of water or waves of light. So our orbitals can constructively or destructively interfere. Before we get to a little more on interference, let's take a closer look at what this phase actually means. So here I have a p orbital, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the intensity of the p orbital as I go from left to right, from the bottom here to the top here. And you'll notice I've labeled this y-axis with a psi, which is the symbol we use for wave functions, because atomic orbitals just are wave functions. And that helps you understand, hopefully, why they can constructively or destructively interfere. So when we start out over on the left side of this p orbital, we're below the y-axis, or x-axis, I'm sorry, because it's a negative phase. And that means that we have negative intensity below the x-axis. And then we're going to go positive on the other side. So you can see here that our atomic orbitals have phases. And that means that if they overlap positive and positive, they'll constructively interfere. But if they overlap negative and positive, they can destructively interfere. So let's take a look at what that looks like with, say, hydrogen. So what we're going to do here is we're going to start with two hydrogen atoms, right? When we start with hydrogen atoms, we have the 1s atomic orbital. And so on the left side and the right side, I've drawn the atomic orbital. And then we're going to mix them together in the center. And what's going to happen is these two guys are going to approach each other. And they're both positive. And that means what's going to happen is they're going to constructively interfere. And so if we think about the new orbital, it's going to look something like this. By the way, that actually turns out to be a sigma bond. And so what we call this very first molecular orbital is 1 sigma. And we use this little g which stands for the German word gerade, which has to do with symmetry. I'm not going to try to say that word again because I'm probably mispronouncing it. So there's constructive interference there, and we call that a bonding orbital. And that's important. So if we get constructive interference between our atomic orbitals, that forms a bonding orbital. And think about what that means. That means we got our hydrogen atom with its protons right here are two hydrogen atoms, and they've come together, and that means that our electrons, there's two of them now, are going to be more likely to be hanging out in the center 
right? That's what constructive interference is here. It's telling you, hey, you're more likely to find the electrons in between the two protons. That means that you have a bonding force, and that's why this is a bonding orbital. What's the other option? How else could hydrogen atoms combine? Well, maybe one of them has a positive phase and one of them has a negative phase, and that's going to lead to pretty different behavior. So again, our orbitals, still 1s's, just with different phases, approach each other. Now, a negative phase and a positive phase, those are going to destructively interfere. And so what we'll get is the positive phase over here, and where it doesn't overlap with the negative phase, we'll get a negative phase over here. But notice, there's nothing in between. We've decreased the chances of finding the electron in between. So if we, again, look at what this looks like in terms of our actual hydrogen atoms, if we have a proton and a proton, our electrons now are more likely to be over here and not in the middle. So no electrons here. And so what we call this is an antibonding orbital. And that means that it destabilizes our molecule. So we prefer, if we want to have a stable bond, to have our electrons in the bonding orbital. And the way we label this is still sigma, but now with a u, which uh, is the opposite of the g, which means we're an antibonding orbital. Okay, so when our atoms combine, they can constructively or destructively interfere, and that changes the types of molecular orbitals they're going to form. And we draw these with orbital diagrams. So now we're going to take a look at what the actual diagrams look like for hydrogen and helium. Again, consider the fact that we have a 1s of our hydrogen atoms coming together. And what that means is we're going to get two new energy levels, one where they constructively interfere and one where they destructively interfere. Which one's going to be higher energy? The destructive interference. Because the destructive interference removes electron density between the protons, raising the energy of that atom. It's the antibonding orbital. So lots of times the way you'll see this drawn is these dashed lines coming down, which means that that 1s orbital is being used to build our bond down there, our orbital down there. And this guy, as I said before, is labeled sigma g, which means that that's a bonding orbital. And now, up top, they could mix in another way. They could mix where they had opposite phases and got destructive interference. And there, we're going to label it 1u, and the little star tells us that it's antibonding. So now we're going to fill in our molecular orbital diagram with those electrons. Where are those electrons going to go? Are they going to go in the high energy orbital or the low energy orbital? Well, of course, the low energy orbital. And now they're going to pair. So there's going to be a spin flip, and they're paired now, and this guy, this hydrogen molecule, is now held together. It's bonded together because of the constructive interference between those two atomic orbitals. And notice that there's electrons in the bonding orbital, but no electrons up here. And that means, basically, we have a bond. That contrasts with what happens when you try to put helium together. We all know hydrogen can form H2. What happens when we put helium together? Well the possibilities for how our orbitals interfere look identical. We can mix our positive phases and get our bonding orbital, which we call sigma g, or we can mix our positive and negative phases and get our antibonding, sigma u star. Now we fill it in with electrons just like we did before. But now you'll notice there's just as many electrons and the antibonding is the bonding orbital. And that means we haven't actually gained in terms of stability. This explains why helium-2 doesn't form. It already has electrons to fill its 1s orbital, and when you mix them together, that means it has to fill both the bonding and antibonding orbital. We'll talk about this more in later videos, but that means it has a bonding order of zero. Basically, it's not forming a bond. So this has just been an introduction to thinking about molecular orbitals. Remember, the main thing we're doing here is we're combining atomic orbitals to form new orbitals that are smeared out over our molecule. Those can be bonding in the case of constructive interference or antibonding in the case of destructive interference. We've only looked at s orbitals. And so in another video, which I'll link to below, we'll talk about what p orbitals look like when they mix. That gets a little more complicated, but the basic idea is the same. You combine atomic orbitals to make molecular orbitals and those can constructively or destructively interfere. Thanks for watching Real Chemistry. Please uh, leave any comments you have below. Uh, you can also subscribe by clicking the Real Chemistry icon below, which I recommend you do. Thanks for watching.